The Sign Institute of Policy and Politics is American University's incubator for policy innovation. We convene leaders in the academic, public, private, nonprofit, and journalism sectors to engage and promote common ground and nonpartisan solutions. In an evolving world, we seize the opportunity to work on the nation's most pressing challenges through collaboration by experts and top scholars in their field with students in research and scholarship. As part of that goal, the Sign Institute leverages American University's location in our nation's capital, the nexus of government and a growing international business center. We connect diverse perspectives from around the country and around the world with our world-class academics and research, experienced practitioners, and the most politically active student body in the U.S. We stand apart through our focus on the role of business and the nonprofit community in public policy the rise of the importance of economic regions in the United States and international policy issues. Our focus is to make an immediate impact at the intersection of policy and politics that leads to real and lasting change. Thank you for joining us as we convene, communicate, and collaborate. Welcome to Reimagining America, the Classroom of the Future with your moderator, Dean Cheryl Holcomb McCoy, School of Education, American University. Good afternoon. I'm Cheryl Holcomb McCoy, Dean of the School of Education at American University, and welcome to the Summer with Signs series, Reimagining America, the Classroom of the Future. I want to thank the entire team at the Sign Institute of Policy and Politics, particularly Executive Director Amy Dacey, for the opportunity to collaborate on this timely webinar. And a special thank you to our very own Bonnie Berry and the School of Education for also supporting this great event. As we prepare to re-enter schools this fall, after what we hope is the worst part of the COVID pandemic, the discussion of what, we did, what did we learn over the last 16 to 18 months will impact hopefully in a positive way the future of education and classrooms. And given the national conversations about education, economic and health disparities due to racism and, qu and the question of how will we re-enter schools that are becoming increasingly diverse, but also are persistently unequal in terms of student outcomes and opportunities, this is very important and in very, in very important questions. So there's so much to unpack and to talk about. And I can't think of a better trio to discuss reimagining classrooms than the group that we have with us today. We have with us, and they can turn on their cameras, Dr. Sonia Douglas Horsford, professor at Teachers College, Columbia University, and author of, learning, of the book, Learning in a Burning House, Educational Inequality, Ideology, and Disintegration. We also have with us Thomas Toke, who is the founding director of Future Ed, an independent think tank at Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy. And we also have with us uh, Wes Moore, former CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation, author of the book, The Other Wes Moore, a governor, a gubernatorial candidate um, in Maryland, and also the assigned fellow this year. This is a rock star panel. And I don't know about you, but I'm so excited um, to have this conversation today about the future of classrooms in America with three experts who have a very unique view on educational outcomes and the education landscape in general. So I wanna just jump in because we only have an hour and how we've structured today is that each of our panelists, our experts will have about three to four minutes to give some opening remarks and to tell us more about them and their thoughts about where we are in education. After their remarks, I have a couple of questions that I want to pose to the group. And then for the last 15 minutes, we will have questions from the audience. So please, if you're out there, please feel free to type in your questions in the chat function um, on, your Zoom port on your Zoom portal. So let's get started and let's start with Dr. Horsford from Columbia University. Dr. Horsford. Thank you, good afternoon everyone. And thank you, uh, Dean Holcomb McCoy for the invitation to participate in this panel as well as the Sign Institute. I'm really excited to be here um, to talk about the future of education in our classrooms. Um, one of the, the exciting projects that I've been working on 
as the founding director of the Black Education Research Collective has been a study where we've surveyed um, 440 individuals, Black students, uh, parents, educators, and community members across the country to really understand directly from them how COVID-19 and heightened racial violence has impacted um, not only their experiences as African-Americans, um, but the implications for education in particular. So I actually want to share um, today some of the findings from that study, which will be uh, provided in a report um, next week. And it's entitled Black Education in the Wake of COVID-19 and Systemic Racism Toward a Theory of Change in Action. And so very quickly, I think, um, and the reason that I want to use my time sharing the findings is because, again, these are the voices and the perspectives of uh, community members um, really expressing how the last year has impacted them. And our study findings um, confirm that indeed the pandemics, the triple pandemics of COVID-19, the economic recession that it has led to and increased um, examples of systemic racism have indeed have had a disproportionate and traumatic impact on black students, families and communities. Um, there is also great concern that the increased, increased racial trauma experienced uh, by black communities, um, as well as mental health issues associated with anxiety, depression and stress um, are going to have major implications for teaching and learning. And so we need to think about uh, the systems and services that are put in place to ensure that these things are addressed uh, when students return back to school in the fall. Um, participants also across the board um, indicated that they just feel that schools are ill-equipped to really meet the academic, social, uh, and emotional needs of Black children. Um, the fourth finding was that the failed responses to COVID-19 um, at every level of government, as well as police brutality um, and the lack of accountability for that, as well as the insurrection uh, at the Capitol have further reduced um, what many scholars have described, described as cultural mistrust in schools and public institutions. And finally, um, and I think this is an actual hope, and hopeful part of the study is that community members still feel that um, they have agency and a role to hold school, local, state and federal leaders accountable for meeting the educational needs of students. And so um, I share these because I think these are indeed the lessons that we have learned over the last year in terms of centering the voices and perspectives of those who have been most impacted when we have conversations about educational equity and social justice and that by better understanding um, the needs of communities in their own words that we can then begin to uh, build back better, uh, to build a new house in which uh, students, uh, no matter their background, will have access to an education that affirms the development of their academic ability. Uh, and so I wanna also share the recommendations which come largely from, uh, again, the respondents uh, from the survey and the focus groups that we conducted across the country. I didn't mention that, but we've conducted focus groups in six metropolitan areas, which included Atlanta, Georgia, Washington, DC, New York City, uh, Detroit, Michigan, Boston, Massachusetts, and my hometown of Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, and so the recommendations really mirror um, the concerns that were expressed in the findings. And that is one, we need to protect and defend the rights of black students. Uh, to receive an appropriate education. And so um, given the incidence of uh, racial discrimination, some of the psychological uh, and physical violence even that students are experiencing in schools, that there needs to be a concerted effort um, in protecting uh, their rights legally and also uh, restoring our commitment to um, the right to have a, an appropriate and fair education for all students. Um, we also recommend that we must make those investments in counseling, psychological and mental health services. Uh, Dean Holcomb McCoy, I know that this is an area uh, that you are well versed in. And so we need to really think about what that looks like for school systems and schools. Um, an example of one individual who, who shared her concerns as an educator about uh, students returning back to school in the fall was just the, the nature of the interactions in terms of the concerns and fears that some may have around their health. And what do you do when a young child runs up to you um, excited to see you again in school. How do we kind of think about and anticipate uh, those interactions and what they may mean for the mental health and wellness of students and educators? The third is to provide professional development to teachers and school leaders, which many of us are already doing in teacher and leadership preparation programs. Uh, but how do we think about, again, making sure that we um, address and acknowledge the concerns that Black community members have had um, to incorporate that into professional learning opportunities and professional development? Um, there is also uh, a need, as demonstrated in this study, as well as communities across the country, to modernize and revamp the curriculum, um, make sure that we are teaching the truth, that it reflects um, the truth about U.S. history, 
what we can learn from it, our own agency as um, members of a democratic society to really advance the values of equality and justice and that the schools are really the place to do that. And so how do we, uh, again, modernize the curriculum as well as the pedagogical approaches and the assessment tools that we use um, and, and viewing those things um, as one to use Dr. Edmund Gordon's term, the pedagogical troika of curriculum, pedagogy and assessment. The fifth recommendation is to invest in the preparation, cultivation, and, and mentoring of culturally relevant teachers. Um, I would say that um, the profession has perhaps not been invested in uh, in the way that it could be to ensure that we have this robust pipeline of teachers. Uh, and this is something that, that parents uh, certainly want. And then finally, you know, finding those ways, again, to engage Black students, families, educators, researchers, and community leaders as experts and equal partners in advancing equity and justice. So these efforts to expand educational opportunity and equity, um, I would argue cannot be done without the voices and perspectives um, of Black Americans, of African Americans, given the legacy um, of the dual system of education in this country. And so how, again, do we uh, acknowledge that history, um, acknowledge um, the fact that we continue to have a dual system of education and engage key stakeholders in the process to reimagine, to re redesign and rebuild an education system that's, that meets our needs um, as a country in the 21st century. Great, thank you, Dr. Horsford. Um, I have lots of questions, but we're gonna move to our next introductory um, uh, remarks by uh, Thomas Tote. Thank you very much, Cheryl, and, and thank you everybody uh, for inviting me to the conversation today. Uh, I thought I'd start with just a, a couple of observations, uh, reflections on uh, what we've learned from the pandemic and, and a couple of thoughts about where we need to place our bets, as it were, um, in the immediate aftermath of the uh, COVID crisis. I mean, I, first, I think it, it's just important to say, as, as Sonia did, um, that the pandemic has cast inequities in, in educational opportunities in pretty stark relief. You know, everything from technology to the, the time that different parents uh, and different groups have to help their students to food security, it's a very long list. And in each instance, the pandemic uh, had, has made quite clear uh, that, that students have very, sorry, that's my phone, have very different, um, educational opportunities available to them. Um, secondly, as, as Sonia mentioned, the isolation that many students suffered during the pandemic highlighted the importance of the connections to peers and caring adults that, that schools offer. Uh, I think that the social and emotional side of schooling is, is more important uh, than we realized before, before the pandemic and, and any response to the pandemic is going to have to to emphasize that side of, of the learning equation uh, for sure. Uh, I think it's also important to realize that we need to get kids back to school. And, and here I'm not talking about the debate between uh, in, in school learning or, or uh, virtual learning. I'm talking about kids getting, getting kids reconnected to the educational process. Uh, the pandemic exacerbated an already troubling student absenteeism problem. Uh, we've done some research that suggests that, that in, in lots of large uh, school districts, there are as many as seven times as many students missing half of all school days, either virtual or, or in person than before the pandemic. If kids aren't in school, they're not learning. Uh, if they're not engaged, they're not learning. And uh, you know, there are many strategies to address the problem, fortunately, but it is a, a significant challenge uh, that, we, that we really need to, to put front and center. Uh, I would suggest that, that one thing that we uh, look at uh, in some depth is the opportunity to build out a national tutoring infrastructure. There's been a lot of talk about uh, helping kids uh, catch up, helping kids uh, complete unfinished learning, uh, and otherwise you know, get the, the wheels of learning uh, back in motion. Um, high, uh, high quality tutoring uh, can do that. Um, uh, and I think that we have an opportunity now, especially with, with the substantial resources that, that are flowing from the federal government uh, to address the COVID crisis, uh, to create a permanent infrastructure uh, that perhaps is housed in the US Department of Education. 
Um, think about the number of, of retirees, uh, recent, co recent um, college graduates, former teachers, volunteers, even high schoolers uh, who, if well-trained uh, and uh, are a part of a system that is uh, providing students substantial and sustained support uh, in, in a variety of different um, topics, uh, subjects, uh, just think about how that would both rebuild students' a sense of connection uh, to adults and to schools, to signal to them that, that in fact, uh, they're important and, and that the adults in their lives, uh, in their educational lives, are, are taking uh, their learning very seriously. But it would also bring many more community members uh, into schools to, to build more strongly a, a relationship that between the home and school and the communities and schools that has been frayed during the pandemic. Uh, so to me, that, that, that's a, a very promising strategy that, that um, I'm hoping that leaders in Washington can, can uh, focus on. So those are just a couple of insights. There's much more to say, uh, but um, you know, those are a few thoughts to start with. Great, thank you. Once again, I have lots of questions, lots of good stuff in there for us to unpack and talk further about. But let's go, let's go to our third um, uh, opening remarks by Wes Moore. Thanks so much, Dean Hulk McCoy. It's great, great to be with you always. And, uh, and, and thank you for including me and, 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 and Tom and, and Dr. Hartsford. I've been fans and admirers of your work for, for a while. So it's, it's, great, it's great to be on the panel with you. Uh, you know, I, I think about where we are kind of collectively as a society and, and so many of the, so many of the, of the fractures that, that uh, I think both, you know, Dr. Hartsford and also Tom uh, spoke about earlier. And the thing that I think is most heartbreaking about it is that none of this is either either a surprising uh, in terms of who got hit hardest and who got hit first. Uh, and, and truthfully, many of the things that we're all bringing and recommending and saying need to be done were things that needed to be done before COVID. Right. And this has been part of the problem. Uh, we, you know, in, in, in the state of Maryland, uh, you know, I, I worked closely with a group of people uh, who came to be known as the Kerwin Commission. And the Kerwin Commission also is known as the blueprint for, for, for Maryland's future. And it's, and it's really exclusively about how are we examining the best practices that were taking place around the country and also truthfully around the world. That people were actually made the investments that people and organizations and governments were making in their students to be able to provide their students with the best, best platforms and, and the best pathways. Uh, literally looking at everything from early childhood development to tutoring platforms to community schools to all these other elements that we've known and data continues to reinforce what actually works. And, and, and you know, not just for all students, but truthfully and specifically for Black and Latino students who oftentimes are the ones who are the most hurt and hindered by, by the educational framework that we have in place right now. Uh, put together a whole series of collections, a whole series of recommendations that included everything from, uh, you know, making sure that we are moving toward and ensuring a universal pre-K and actually needs to be going earlier. Truthfully, the idea of a universal 3K, uh, where it really is about the, and it's an understanding that students in a structured educational environment, in a quality educational environment, as early as possible is in the best interest of not just the child, but the parent. How are we focusing on tutoring assets and supports after school programming, all these other elements? Uh, how are we increasing the numbers of, 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 black, of black and brown teachers inside of the classroom? All these things that we know form as best practice mechanisms for, for student growth and student development. Uh, as as we were working on these different recommendations, there was a word that not one of us knew, uh, and that was COVID. And you saw how when COVID hit, it just showed not just the need for the speed that we needed to move into these elements, but frankly, uh, it, it showed there was just a larger need also for a, a, a doubling of how we're thinking about the investments that we need to make, uh, because the baseline had moved. If you look at the city of Baltimore, for example, uh, in the city of Baltimore alone, 61% of high school freshmen are chronic over, have been left chronically absent after this school year. 61%, by definition, are missing over 30% or more uh, of the school year of high school freshmen, many of whom, uh, which means basically we're not even sure where many of them are, many of whom have actually gone into the workforce. And so the difficulty of getting a student who is now inside the workforce to now come back into school 
at a place and at a level where we know they are not academically at the same place that they were before is not just remarkably challenging, it's remarkably almost unfair at that point. And so how do we then reconcile those differences? Uh, as we're thinking about the things that we need to do when it comes to education, we also, uh, and, and we'll go into this, and in, 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 I know we're going to go into this, is think about the other services and supports that need to be in place if we're going to continue to propel educational supports like parental leave, childcare, all these other elements when it comes to making sure the students are getting the supports from home that we can make sure that they're getting, then the students are getting what they also need. And so as we're having a conversation about the future of education, it's also going to be really important that we talk about not just what happens within the classroom, but then also how are we making sure we're supporting the families and the groupings that are then making sure that the students are getting what they need for long-term success as well. Great. And I think that's a, thank you, Wes. And I think that's a great way to segue into this question around, um, so if I were, so just imagine I'm a school superintendent, I'm Chancellor Farabee right here in DC or um, a local, any superintendent or chancellor. And as we think about the fall and we think about the, the laundry list that all of you have pretty much laid out, all of the inequities that were there before pre-COVID still in place now exacerbated, what would you tell a school or a district superintendent or a chancellor or better yet a state superintendent who is really close to the legislators that are making decisions about this era post-COVID if there's such a thing? Um, what they, where they should put their investments. And, and I totally agree. And this notion of we cannot solve educational, education inequities in a silo. You know, it, it is more systemic and structural beyond the school, beyond the classroom. So what would, if I were a superintendent, where should I be putting my time and my energy and my investments? What would you say to that? I mean, where, where should I look? Because I'm sure there are folks out there that are thinking, okay, I get it, but what should I do? Anybody can take that. <laughs> I'm happy to start there. Um, I co-direct a program, a doctoral program for aspiring superintendents. Um, and it's a very difficult and challenging job and was so before COVID. Um, but I think really listening to community members is really key here. Um, I know it sounds simple and that there are a lot of listening sessions that are currently happening now, whether by state senators, you know, um, school state level superintendents or district superintendents. But I really do think this is an opportunity, especially in light of a lot of the political conflict that's happening around CRT and discussions that are happening at school board meetings currently to really open up the conversation about what is being taught in our schools. Um, and although that's a very macro kind of approach to thinking about education, I think we have to kind of understand what our vision of education is, what we believe the purpose of education is currently, and in terms of where we want our country to be, and that superintendents should be really at the helm of those conversations uh, to help us understand and to help communicate that vision uh, to legislators as well as parents and community members. So I think you know, we're at a moment where we've learned a lot about who we are as a country. Uh, we've learned a lot about the importance of schools. I think that COVID also showed how significant schools are to communities, um, not just in terms of teaching and learning and what happens around student achievement, but how they're really the heart uh, and hub of communities. And so how do we leverage that reality um, and for superintendents to think about their schools and school systems as levers for change for social equity? So I think there's a great opportunity um, to take full advantage of all of the stakeholders that you know work together in schools and use that as a way to reimagine really um, what we hope to be as a country and as a society. I, and also, I, go ahead, go ahead, Tom. Go, go ahead, Wes. Well, no, I, I would say uh, so. So first, I, I uh, completely echo that. I, I think you know how we're having not just a conversation about community but with community in terms of this rebuild is going to be crucial. It's going to be crucial, not just in terms of the, uh, you know, not just in terms of implementation. It's also going to be crucial in, in terms of the validity uh, of the conversation, because I think that there was another thing that, that uh, there was a deep, um, there was a, a deep hit on uh, when it comes to COVID, and that's just basic trust. Uh, the only way you're going to reinforce that, the only way you're going to rebuild that is actually making sure that the community actually feels part of a, of a rebuilding aspect. The other thing that I would say to um, to people who are looking at budget allocation and about, you know, how do you make impossible uh, priorities because everything 
is going to be a priority at this point. But, um, but we have to also focus on starting earlier. Uh, you know, if, if we're looking at what the data also continues to show and reinforce everything from what are you going to get the highest levels of return on the investments to, to, the, to the challenges that we have as students are facing once you hit students who are hitting first and third and fifth grades and still do not have a lot of the basics that's going to take for them to be able to compete. And you see this compounding level of disparity that continues to exist. Our ability to be able to start early uh, with students, with parents, uh, with guardians is crucial. And, and it's starting early, both in making sure that the students get what they need, making sure that the student is walking into their first structuring educational experience, knowing colors and letters and numbers and all the other basics that, that is a basic framework, the building blocks. Um, but it's also all the other factors that then will play into what they're going to need. So for example, you know, making sure that, uh, that, that, that children and students have the medical care that they need, the eye care that they need, the dental care that they need, all the other things that also contribute to chronic absence and the other things that contribute to, uh, to, to educational disparities. And so, uh, so again, in, in an impossible situation where you have to prioritize, uh, we, we need to make sure we're starting earlier to be able to support students as well. Okay. Yeah, and, and to, to that point, Wes, uh, the data suggests that, that substantial uh, percentages of, of students uh, who would have uh, uh, enrolled in, in pre-K and even kindergarten uh, did not uh, over the last year. So there are many more students who uh, are going to be starting school later, uh, not earlier. Uh, so uh, a, a, an investment in, in high quality uh, early literacy and preschooling is just two examples would be a, a really uh, smart use of some of the federal relief monies. Uh, I, I would say again, and, and sort of in the spirit of what Sonia and Wester have just said, uh, getting kids back to school is, is, is really important. Um, and one way to do that is to reach out to families through home visiting programs uh, where you've got volunteers or, or even uh, school staff actually going into the homes of kids, connecting with the parents, seeing what, seeing what uh, their needs are, uh, both to signal uh, to them that they are valued, uh, that they are part of the, the uh, post-pandemic equation in their communities and schools, uh, but also to get a clear sort of inventory of, of what their needs are uh, and what the, the students' needs are, be they academic or, or other challenges. And then relatedly, uh, because as we do know, um, many students uh, have, have suffered anxiety and stress and, and in some instances trauma, uh, you know, building out schools capacity to respond to that with more school nurses, counselors, <clears throat> excuse me, got a bit of a cold, um, uh, social workers and the like, building out that infrastructure is, is going to be really important to get kids in a position uh, sort of socially and emotionally where they can learn again. And I don't, and we shouldn't ne uh, neglect teachers in that equation either, because that you know some of them have been through a lot, uh, and we need to make sure that everybody's okay um, before we can um, get learning going again. And then uh, I guess I would also just reiterate what I said a few minutes ago, which is that you know one thing we can do is just build out the infrastructure and the, the instructional infrastructure in schools through. Uh, bringing in mentors and tutors and others who can serve this dual role of, of helping kids regain momentum in learning, but also be there as adults for them uh, to signal to them um, that, that people care about them. You want kids caring because um, they feel cared about, and, and that's always, and, and that is a particular challenge in, in the environment that we're facing post-pandemic. Yeah, and you know, this notion of tutoring and the academic support, um, I used to work with Bob Slavin at Johns Hopkins, who did a lot of extensive research um, around tutoring. It's never, you know, it's one of those um, um, pieces of research that we know that works, but it's hard to impl implement on a large scale. And so the question now becomes, you know, what now that we know that technology, we do have the ability to connect to students in different ways other than in person. The question becomes how, what have we learned about remote learning that we want to keep? Should we start thinking about ways that we can expand tutoring or academic supports uh, virtually? 
I, I would love to know your thoughts about, you know, the, the use of technology moving forward. Uh, what have we learned about that and how can we use technology possibly to help us with some of these um, aspects of learning and teaching um, that we want to expand um, and take to scale? Your thoughts on that? Well, I'll share a couple of things just real quickly. One is that you know, part of the, the strategy or, or one strategy for re-engaging students and, and their parents is, is through technology, through uh, text messaging systems that are emerging, uh, email systems uh, to, to give uh, students, as some have called them, nudges uh, about the importance of school and schooling and, and to, to re, uh, reconnect. The other thing I'd say is that we, we have learned uh, through the innovations of some school districts around the country and some nonprofits that have emerged uh, that we can do a better job than we have uh, in getting our best teachers in front of the largest number of students uh, through technology. So for example, a school could have its, uh, its stellar, uh, elementary school could have its stellar reading teacher uh, do a reading lesson across the entire grade via um, Zoom uh, to kids. And then you could have the other teachers in the classroom supporting that child. You could do the same thing with, with uh, chemistry across an entire high school. Uh, and in one instance, there's a, a nonprofit called Cadence that, that set up a national model where they went out and recruited uh, a really stellar group of, of uh, teachers, a very diverse group, by the way. Um, and uh, these are these teachers are working uh, to communicate lessons or share lessons uh, with uh, school districts, charter school networks and others all over the country. And the local teacher, classroom teachers, are working in, in collaboration with that teacher to build on the, the, the sort of national teacher lessons, um, but also support their students in different ways. I mean, that sort of innovation, I think, is, is um, a very valuable legacy of, of uh, the difficult circumstances we found ourselves in over the last year and a half. So there are some things like that we can build on, and we should be attuned to them where we, where we can be. Sonia or Wes, I mean, technology is also one of those points in which we think about inequities. To use technology, you have to have access to the infrastructures for technology. What are your thoughts around technology within this context of existing inequities? Yeah, and, and I think that that is, it, it's such a crucial point because I think when we talk about the, the things that we've learned from, uh, I, I think some of the basic takeaways that, uh, that we took is that, you know, first, first particularly from the early stage, uh, that, that technology can never take away from the importance of in-person and having that human connection and that human, uh, and, and that human interaction with students. And I, I think that we got a chance to see the importance of, 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 of teachers and in-person uh, and in-person learning, uh, not just in terms of how people will communicate and learn, but it's also teachers in many cases became your, you know, your, 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 your first line of, of defense to know when something at home wasn't happening right. Uh, teachers became the first line of defense of, you know, sometimes even just giving kids a hug. Uh, and, you know, for, for a kid who, who might not have been getting that from the household or whatever the case might be, right? I mean, like so many of the assets and the virtues that teachers brought to the equation, I, I think we're just, we're, uh, we're, we're completely highlighted during this crisis. And, and I think you're absolutely right, Dean. I, mean, I think one of the other things that we saw was that we were actually asking some of the wrong questions when it came to technology usage and technology applications when it comes to students. I mean, when the, when the, when the pandemic first began, became, began, we were asking questions like, you know, asking parents, do you have a computer in the house? Irrelevant question if I have four children, right? I mean, so these are things we, we had to get smarter as to how we were using technology, what could be the practical usage of technology, and then how do we have that as a framework of scale? And then the third piece uh, that you highlight as well is, uh, you know, there should be no question that we should have as a society about the need for high speed and universal internet broadband access to everybody. Uh, you saw how things were just shut down in a family if you did not have that basic asset. It wasn't even just that the student did not have the capacity and the ability to, to learn. It's That's the main way people are applying for jobs. That's the main way people are applying for benefits. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you don't have that as a baseline, it's the way we're having this conversation right now, yeah. right? <laughs> if you don't have that as a basic frame, you're completely left out. 
And so I, I think that uh, there, there were, so there are many mechanisms of, of, uh, of, of, of online learning, technolog technological assets in education that I think we can take from. I think we got smarter at it over the process of the past year. Um, but I also think it, it just, it, it reminded us about the importance of having that, that in-person face-to-face, particularly for the younger ages and particularly for, for, for uh, you know, for, for students that have higher needs. Yeah. And teachers too, teachers having access. And teachers right? too. Yeah. 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 I think Sonia, you were going to say something. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, I agree that we need to ensure that uh, access to technology is part of our civic infrastructure. Um, but that we could also learn a lot from students around technology. I mean, I don't know about you, but my children uh, teach me a lot about even the uses of it. And I wonder if there might be ways, again, to incorporate their own experiences over the last year around technology and hear from them in terms of what would be more useful and beneficial. Um, I know my children didn't really like remote learning in many ways. I mean, unless it was engaging. And so it really depended on the teacher's capacity and ability to use the technology uh, in a way that wasn't simply putting something online, but really you know, having the training uh, and the capacity to develop lessons that were engaging um, and where students really felt like they were learning something and that it was valuable. So I think a lot of the concerns about students lo not logging on and engaging and even parents um, could be around how uh, virtual or remote learning is uh, implemented and that uh, the, the education profession, um, there should be resources, time and funding and support to really help us to develop the tools that we use um, and that students might be a part of that learning process. Right, absolutely. I mean, I think that this, you know, the use of technology, we've talked about this a lot pre-COVID, the accelerant of the pandemic forced us to th really think about how to integrate um, different forms of technology in a classroom. And um, I think we're probably not looking back. We're going to still continue to use technology in some way, but this access question and the infrastructure around it is a really important, um, a really important question as we think about policy change um, looking forward. Let's talk more about the classroom because that is, you know, the future of the classroom, what will it look like? And one of the, one of the I get this question a lot about what are you going to do about diversifying the workforce, the teacher workforce? What about, you know, why don't we have as many black and brown teachers as we used to? And, and we don't have enough men in general and black and brown men in a classroom. Um, it's almost like a unicorn. <laughs> I mean, you don't see it that often. Um, what are we going to do about that? Our um, student population in the U.S. and particularly in the D.C. region here um, we're seeing um, what we call high minority or predominantly uh, schools that are predominantly either Black or Latinx. Um, and we're seeing, we're seeing just stark segre segregation in um, our schools. And it, as far as around the country, we're seeing some of those same dynamics. I think it's been um, projected that by 2044, the U.S. will be a majority minority country. So what does that mean for us? I mean, as far as recruiting and, um, and retaining um, you know, black and brown teachers, getting them into the teacher workforce and the leader workforce, we see some of the same um, declines in the number of principals and, and school leaders um, as far as diversity and bilingual um, teachers and administrators too. What should we be doing? What is the, I mean, the future of the classroom can't look like it's looking now uh, where we're seeing the teacher workforce overwhelmingly women, female and um, overwhelmingly white. What are we gonna do? Who wants to take that one first? <laughs> I'm happy, oh, go ahead, Wes. Oh, please, please, I'm sorry. No, I, I just think that we have to really rethink the purpose and vision of schooling and the profession. Um, you know, you think about what teachers have gone through over the last year and is that, I don't know if that's a good advertisement for and we've lost <laughs> what we're expecting teachers. Yeah, over the, over the you know, from teachers. And I think already, especially for, um, at least through the research that I've done and others around um, the black teacher and administrator pipeline, you know, teaching and preaching were really the primary professions, you know, uh, during Jim Crow and, and prior to desegregation. And so when opportunities expanded for um, Black professionals, I think that we, we began to see uh, the pipeline diminish. And we also saw that after desegregation where a lot of Black teachers and administrators lost their jobs or were demoted. Um, and so we're still trying to recapture that. But I think we need to make 
sure that there's alignment between, again, the purpose and vision that we have for education uh, and the values that many educators of color hold, uh, which is very different from the way that we deliver instruction now. And so I think we have to, I hope that we can change uh, public sentiment around the role of schools and what they look like, um, what happens in the classroom in schools, um, and that we're able to um, use more culturally relevant practices and really take advantage of a lot of the research that's been done over the last few decades around how humans learn um, and the diversity of the ways in which we learn, um, and that that would attract in and of itself um, a pipeline of teachers and educators, um, of course, with appropriate compensation uh, and respect for educators as a profession. So I think that those things can happen. I think we're gonna be forced to move in that direction, quite frankly, because I feel that the generations coming behind us um, are not interested in keeping schools um, and maintaining them in the way that they currently operate. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. And I, and I think that there, there has to be a recentering in how we actually talk about education and how we talk about educators. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's one of these things where when, you know, when we have conversations and I know we have them in the state of Maryland about, you know, what is, what are the jobs of now and jobs of the future? Uh, you know what jobs of now and jobs of the future are and always will be education, you know, and, but, but we never talk about it in that way. We talk about life sciences, cyber, biopharma, all great things that are jobs of the future and industries, et cetera. But, but also who is, who is preparing our students for those jobs? Who, who are preparing, you know, the, the, the community for all these new industries that are versioning and, 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 uh, and going to create explosive measures of growth. So I, I sometimes feel like there's this, there is this, there's a huge focus area that we continue to miss when it comes to what are the jobs that we should be, that we should be, you know, putting resources behind and we should be recruiting for, and we should be, and we should be prioritizing that it's not just the, where is the industry of the future going? But it's also who's going to help us get there and who's going to be there once we actually get there in the, in the, in the long term. That, that how we think about incentivizing people and to go into different areas, how, you know, they, I, I, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a quote that I love that from a mentor of mine where he basically says, he says, you find what you look for. And, and, and until we can be very deliberate about looking for the type of teachers, the type of instructors, the type of people who will be in the front of classrooms, the type of people who will be held accountable for the future growth of our children. You know, we cannot just sit there and continue to scratch our head and say, I wonder where they are. You find what you look for. And, uh, and I think that that's the type of approach we have to take when it comes to really, you know, filling up the right kind of pipeline for the, for our educators. We might use that. We might use that uh, as our, uh, byline in the school of education you find what you look for thank you Wes okay and I, I will say Wes Moore said when, when I put it up there but anyway uh, Tom you were going to say something yeah so I, I would just uh, echo uh, Wes's uh, uh, urging that uh, schools school districts be more proactive uh, you, you can't sit back and, and wait for uh, for people to come to you, especially in, in an environment, despite the, the sort of racial reckoning that we're going through and the continued sort of challenges we face around race in the nation, there are many more opportunities for talented young uh, people of color coming out of college. And if schools want to compete uh, for that talent, they, they're going to have to be more proactive. Um, uh, I do think there are some things we can do. Uh, um, I think uh, Sonia's suggestion that that the curriculum um, it plays a, a not small factor in, in people's decision to, to teach it um, or not, right? I mean, if, if you're uh, uh, a Black person and, and not able to, to teach any Black literature uh, to, to in your high school English class, not that that's the case, but I'm, I'm just creating hypothetical, then, you know, you're not going to be as inclined to, to do the work. Uh, so that, that's a component of it. Now, I also think that that you know, just the, the sort of hiring cycles that districts typically use, which uh, tend to be slow, 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 and then panic in the late summer, um, you know, is, is not conducive to the, uh, you know, finding what you search for uh, sort of uh, sense of, of how you increase numbers of, of uh, uh, teachers of color either. Um, and, 
uh, you know, so starting the recruitment cycle earlier in the year, looking more broadly, um, being proactive <clears throat> the way, by the way, Teach for America does, you know, Teach for America core members are what 50% people of color. Um, that's not an insignificant achievement. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of those uh, core members are coming from selective college campuses, again, where uh, people of color coming off of those campuses, you know, have many opportunities. So that, that I think is important. Uh, you know, I've, uh, we've been promoting the idea of a national teacher corps uh, that would be run out of the U.S. Department of Education, whereby it's a it's a uh, reincarnation of an old program, uh, whereby uh, people who agreed to serve for three years in in uh, high poverty Title One schools would receive supplements and uh, annual salary supplements. Uh, they'd have college debt um, uh, forgiven and the like, and uh, you know you could tweak that model to uh, focus on students coming out of minority serving colleges and universities um, to in increase the pipeline. Uh, and then also I think school districts need to be much more proactive uh, in ensuring that, that they not only hire teachers of color, but then uh, be deliberate about creating uh, sort of professional opportunities for them within the schools and school districts, uh, becoming mentor teachers, becoming curriculum uh, advisors and the like, you know, the, the range of things that teachers can do once they get hired to grow themselves professionally, make more money and, and improve their, 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 raise their standing in the profession. You know, too often teachers of color come in, uh, even where we're able to, to, to get them in and they don't stay very long. Uh, and so that becomes you know, partly a function of, of the curriculum, partly a, a function of culture, um, but also uh, it's a function of opportunity as well. So it's, it's a combination of things. And I would be remiss if I didn't put a plug in for our teacher pipeline project here at American University, where we're looking at those uh, transitions and trying to in bring um, high school students to, um, to the table earlier in introducing education careers to them and giving them opportunities to come to universities free of charge um, with new, a new curriculum that's, that's focused on anti-racist practices and teaching practices, um, specifically uh, focused um, on teaching children, black and brown children, and then staying with them post graduation and coaching um, them during those first five years that are so critical. I think this notion of earning while you learn and creating partnerships with minority serving institutions is undervalued. We need to talk about that much, much more. So that's um, just had to put that plug in because that's, um, that's really near and dear to my heart. Okay, we have um, just a few, we have a few minutes and a couple of questions. This has been, I have a slew of more questions, but I, and I know folks out there do too. Um, but let's just switch over to um, Amy Dacey, who is taking questions from the audience. Well, thank you so much, Dean. I appreciate it. While you were leading this incredible conversation, I was able to monitor and track some of the questions coming in. I'm Amy Dacey. I am executive director of the Sign Institute, and we'll just get right to it. We've got some incredible um, uh, questions from, from the group that's joined us today. One of the things is to, to further something you were talking about, Thomas and, and, with, and Sandra, with curriculum. One of the questions is from Tara, and Tara wants to know, you know, what advice would we give to administrators who want to engage in accurate and further narratives, not only about history, but current events and, you know, uh, civics education, um, which it can be such a hotbed of conversation and, you know, the public and with adults, but how are we bringing those conversations to young people so that, that we can find consensus and, and whatnot going forward? I think it's a big question for a lot of people. I don't know if, uh, Sandra, you want to start just because I know you were talking a little bit about curriculum, but like, how are we looking at that, you know, information to bring it to the classroom as well? How are we having conversations about things that are happening in the news? Yeah, I think it's a complicated uh, and multi-layered question in that I think there is kind of this political dimension to uh, the fight around what can be taught in schools as well as an instructional question, right? Um, and you know, I think many of us are still trying to get our heads, heads around that in terms of how it's playing out on the ground, what it means for teachers who, you know, are interested in teaching what is now perceived as sensitive topics around race and racism. Um, and again, it was already an issue for many educators. I know in New York City, for example, um, after the inauguration, many teachers were told not to 
uh, show the inauguration, um, not to talk about it. They then were later able to show the poem um, from the young lady that delivered the poem, but it's just kind of a murky area where depending on the school that you're at, who the administrator is um, and the culture of that school, whether or not um, there, there will be a chilling effect for teachers around these issues. So I think um, there's the instructional and curricular question, but there's also a political question, I think, around how communities are going to be organizing um, in ways to support, protect, and defend uh, their teachers and their ability to teach the content that they think is important for their students. It's important. Anybody want to add anything to, to that question? I mean, not, nothing more really than to say that the basic uh, role of education is to, to uh, illuminate and uh, and and you know, not indoctrinate, and and you can indoctrinate people by refusing to talk about certain issues, right? So, uh, you know, that that's not really uh, what we're what we're trying to do here. Um, and this this notion of um, is education political or not? I think education truly is. Um, and so this, I think um, this question of what we can teach and what we cannot teach is something that the classroom of the future, education systems in the future will have to come to some level of consensus on um, teaching history and teaching what it, what is. I mean, that is, um, but we haven't gotten there yet. No. Yeah. And, 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 and to, that, to that point, the only thing I, I would add on is all this stuff and many of these conversations are going to be incredibly local and incredibly granular. Um, where this is about understanding the histories, the geographies within our own localized jurisdictions. And it's going to be a place where, you know, where, where people are not, don't necessarily have to or will not have to wait for Congress or the Secretary of Education or the White House to be putting these things out. These are very granular and very localized conversations that our local leaders, I think, are rightly taking a, a, a measure of leadership on. I think that's important and, and to, there's actually a question that bounces off a, a lot on that, Wes, and to something that you said earlier, Thomas, about this schools and communities working together to, to solve problems. So the question is, in that localized conversation, you have a lot of players, you have teachers, you have administrators, and you also have school boards that are often elected positions and maybe people who have experience in education or not. Who's at the table? Who's bringing this conversation together? Um, one of our questioners wants to know who has to be in the room to make the decision about the classroom of the future. I don't. Well, everybody, I, it's it's difficult. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think Sonia said it early on. Uh, you want the community you uh, to be uh, included. You want the conversation to reflect. The diversity of uh, of stakeholders uh, and perspectives in a community, um, you know, there needs to be sort of uh, effective mechanisms to do that, so you don't uh, end up uh, dealing with these issues in the form of shouting matches uh, at you know school board meetings. Um, but you know, good local educational leaders should would recognize that that. Um, the diverse perspectives in their community should be uh, included in a conversation about, uh, you know, the curriculum and 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 topics within it. Uh, you know, as well as drawing on sort of instructional experts and, and you know, curriculum specialists and the like. I mean, it's you know, that's it's easy to sit here and say that, but but that's uh, you know, really the goal, right? Right. Right. Um, another question I thought was really interesting, and it might even be interesting to hear you weigh in on this, Dean, as well as, you know, our educators and what we've learned certainly during COVID and, you know, over the course of the last few years, because these conversations have been so public, is sometimes we also expect our teachers to, to be um, security agents, to be mental health, you know, um, experts, uh, to be social workers, like, so much is happening, you know, to students, like, how are we preparing teachers and giving them support so that they're able to do the work they need to do when all these other issues are, are coming up and they sometimes are the ones that interact with these students and see them the most? I mean, are we educating them in a way to help them with that? Are we trying to find other means to support them? 
you want me to take that? <laughs> yeah, I, anybody, I just... Because I, just... I live that every day. Wow. Um, you know, if I had my way, I would blow up some of our teacher... Pre- our, we, as we did at, at um, American University, we sort of pulled apart our teacher prep program and put it back together again. And in that process of putting it back together again, we asked ourselves and our partners um, in DCPS and um, some of our local education colleagues that are out in the field, what is it that teachers need to know to be successful? And um, we were amazed that um, our colleagues knew, we asked that question, they knew immediately that we need teachers who um, understand um, issues of oppression, the effect of oppression on education, racism, um, that there's a good, a keen understanding and a very interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary understanding that there's a, that teachers are well-versed uh, in historical facts um, and are able to bring that to their work. We also learned that teachers need to know not just the pedagogical still skills um, of learning how to teach, but also how students learn. And so we've brought that into um, our teacher prep program. So that's just, those are just some examples. But I do think that each year there should be some type of audit, maybe not each year, but every three years, an audit of, uh, of a program in which you're saying, what more do our stu- students need to know in order to be ready to teach? And then I think partnerships with, I think universities um, and colleges of education should be working more closely and collaboratively with local school districts and, um, and school education leaders and advocates um, to understand how the university and, and teacher training programs can fill some of those knowledge and skill gaps. Um, that's our role. And I, I would say that we have not played enough of a role um, and that, so when you're talking about who should come to the table, I think universities, schools, and colleges of education, um, faculty members, and um, deans should be at that table and willing to collaborate. Um, we have another question that I do think is interesting because one thing that happened during COVID is some of the things that help with uh, students and young people develop our extracurricular activities. We're talking about music programs, arts programs, sports programs. And during COVID, a lot of that oftentimes was taken away in the classroom. And so the question is to all of you, and it's, um, you know, what what role does that play? What role should that play? And is it, um, you know, we saw it kind of taken away during COVID. Like for the classroom of the future, what importance are there with these extracurricular activities and having them students have access to them? I think it's critical. I mean, I think this is part of um, the recommendation to revamp the curriculum as well as assessment and how we teach it, um, including arts, music, um, making sure that we are exposing students to a variety of different experiences. Um, A lot of that happened even prior to COVID, um, given our focus on high stakes testing and the academic content areas. And I just think, again, this is the moment where many of us who have been dreaming about expanding uh, the curriculum and doing some of the things that I at least, you know, had the privilege of enjoying as a student are, you know, re-entered into the classroom and become a, a part of the educational experience. I would, I would say it also becomes crucial because uh, there is a, a very important aspect of, of the education frame, which we, which we, we haven't as he- heavily emphasized in this conversation, which is, which is the issue of mental health yes. um, and, and, and the role and A, the challenge that I think all of us are, are not just already starting to see, but anticipating um, as, we, as we enter back into a classroom, but also what are the ways that we're going to be able to both be able to address it and then also ways being able to identify it and understand it. Uh, even when we're thinking about a basic classroom framework, uh, if you are a, a teacher who is in a class of whether it's 20 or 30 or 45 students inside of that classroom, the basic ideas of being able to understand and dissect what was happening in individual students, even when we get back into a classroom environment, is challenging. Uh, the more opportunities that we have to have measures of social interaction, the more opportunities that we have for, for, for the brain to be exercised, from a variety and a collection of different uh, perspectives, particularly the young and developing uh, a child, child's brain, uh, is not just good for them, but it's also it's also one of the most effective ways we're going to be able to I see and identify if there are other additional supports or or, or, or assets that we need to introduce into that child's uh, into that child's life. 
it's an incredible note and I know we've run out of time. I'll just say briefly um, from the Sign Institute, thank you all three of you for you know participating for um, Dean, for you leading this conversation. We were gonna follow up and have um, more conversations about this. We can follow all of our um, guests on their on their Twitter you know feed to find out like the work that they're doing as well. If you go to and sign up for the Sign newsletter, we're gonna follow up um, and we will replay this as well for, for information. This is the first conversation we hope in many because this is an evolving you know learning moment um dean i'll give you the the final word and any last closing remarks but thank you for your leadership at au and the school of education thank you amy for this opportunity to collaborate and i'm glad you said that this is the first of many conversations and i can't wait to follow up maybe with our three experts here um as we go into the fall and spring and um just thank the three of you for taking time uh with us today uh you're busy people and you could have been doing other things so i just want to say how grateful we are um to you um for your uh, time and your expertise today thank you so much thank you for a great conversation great thank you thank you, thank you. bye